Jane, you've had this um, long and distinguished career as an actress. And, um, but a few years ago, you sort of branched out at, at, into other aspects of filmmaking. You... Well, yeah, I couldn't get a job. <laughs> Nobody wanted to hire me because I'm old. Wow. And, and, right. and we're in an ageist business, which is why I started doing the, the horror stories because there were some nice parts, a couple of nice parts that I had in them, and really nice parts. And also, they were great stories. And I had control, some control of, of the stories that I wanted to tell. And that is, that is the beauty of making your own films. Right, because you and lose. I think also because, it, you know, again, it, it gives, there's a lot of women's stories. We can do a whole series of nothing but classic women's stories. Um, and there's a lot of actresses who want to work and should work, and that there isn't always the parts for them. Would you say it's more difficult for for female for actresses uh, to to find satisfactory parts uh, who are actresses who are older than for men who are of the same age? Yes, I do. I really do. I mean, I, I, as I said. At my age, as, as the men get older as well, we end up the, the, not taking leading roles. I mean, people like uh, uh, Harrison Ford, who managed to a s s glide agelessly through at the age of 80 or whatever he is, because he's a wonderful star and everybody loves to see him. And even Tom Cruise is getting on a bit, you know, but that's rare. And I think that... Um, you know, you, it's always been a very discriminatory business. You go in for an audition, and I was listening to some really quite A-list actors talking about their auditions. They're on YouTube, and that's fascinating. And there's a lovely, lovely clip between Matt Damon and Ben Aslick about how all the parts they were rejected for. And you said, you walk out of the room, and you know you haven't got that role. When they said, yeah, okay, well, thank you very much. Right, next. <laughs> Yeah, and you just, you've got to have the, the heart of a lion and the skin of a rhinoceros to be in this business and whoever you are and whatever age, I think. But it gets harder as you get older and it's even harder if you're a woman. But, but how did, how, I mean, you've had that throughout your career. You said it's always competitive. It's always difficult. Yeah. How do you, how do you? I was incredibly lucky, Lance, when I started. I started in an industry in London when London was the swinging sixes. It was really hot. There was fantastic material around on the BBC and on ITV. And I got lucky with my first big job. And it just careened on from there. I never had to audition. I got script after script. Wow. And I just sailed through it all. <laughs> I thought, this is wonderful. I'm having a great time. Never worried about making lots of money. Never worried about being a big star. Just loved it because the parts were so good. And then... Um, you know, things changed as you get older. And then I got married and went to Hollywood, and it was quite a lot different there. You, you had to audition for a pretty... No, at the beginning, I was offered the roles because I went out with a very big calling card, which was The Lion in Winter. Yeah. But after they'd kind of, you know, used that one up, then, then you have to start auditioning and everything. And you had a very successful career in television. I did. Yeah. I, I had a wonderful career in television. No complaints, you know. No complaints. And we can see all, the, all that on that. You can YouTube. see all that. Yes. You can see them all on YouTube. Okay, we'll look forward to that. Yeah. But in the meantime, now you're, you're producing, you've written and produced, are producing a feature yeah. that will, and how did that, how did that come up? Well, I decided I wanted to do another feature film and I was sitting at the computer. I was, another short that is, and I was sitting at my computer and I thought, this is weird. You know, every time I want to do something, it tells me how to do something better. And I thought, who's in charge here, me or the computer? And I thought, this is interesting. And I thought, um, what if the computer, you know, was really guiding one's life? And we know about Alexa, and we know that Alexa does, has entered into people's lives, and people rely on it. And um, I thought, yes, that's interesting, but it would have to have the form of a... Of a thing, a person. So first of all, I thought a, a, a robot, you know, a little robot about this eye running around. I thought a short film, even a short film with a woman and a doll is not terribly interesting. <laughs> so we need to have a human being and finding an actor who could A, be good enough and B, have that sort of slightly out of the world look 
was I kept watching all the actors around Boise because I was going to do it here, and lighted on Austin Van Johnson, who is a wonderful actor. Really talented. And uh, I thought, sure, yeah, he's good, and Austin can do this. So uh, <clears throat> we, we did it, and um, Austin came on. He gave a lovely performance. I dearly wish he was able to, to, to do it in, in England, but work permits, travel, and all of that, it's yeah. very difficult. And I've partnered now with a young actor-director who really does want to and deserves to play the part. So he's going to play the part. So the, uh, the sorry, Austin is the you, you made a short film or a short. I made the short film with Austin, and we shot that in Boise in 2018. Got a good response um, from even from some people in Hollywood who say, "Hey, that's a great idea." Oh, it was a great. good film, very good, um, and it went to some festivals. And I had a, a company approach me and said uh, we would like to take it on and represent it and so on. And I thought, well. This is a really good story, and I think it could be told in a lot, because people also say, well, what happened next? Right. What happens next after this relationship between this woman and this AI robot, humanoid robot? So I thought, well, I'll have a go at writing a script. So I wrote a long, full-length feature. It was okay. It wasn't really quite good enough. And then went through various people who said, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? And then eventually I, 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 I worked with this young actor on The Haunting of Malcolm Castle. And we started talking about it. He said, "Let me, can I have a go? And I said, sure. Well, he's young, he's about 27. And he had, he brought the, 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 that generational thing into it, which we needed because I'm, I, you know, I am of a certain generation, and I, my point of view is different from a man of 26. So the combination now works in the script. There's both points of view, which is what we needed, uh, the modern and, and, and the more traditional, if you will. And the script really works, and, and we worked on it, and we've honed it. We're going to be doing a little more rewriting on it and cutting a couple of characters out that really don't add anything to the story. And then I thought, shall we go through the whole drama of now shopping it around mm -hmm. with bigger producers who are going to say, yes, but we're not like this. Could you write it like that? And we're going to need a really big name to do this. So you can't play the part that you've written for yourself. We want, you know, we want Meryl Streep. We want uh, Glenn Close. We want. Who and I thought, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. Give and me I a <laughs> It's just so exhausting. I've done it once. I spent five years on a feature film oh. going through all of this. So a, a wonderful story with a great script by David Seidler. Oh, wow. Who wrote The King's Speech. Yes. David was nobody when we started. By the time we'd finished it, he'd won the Oscar oh. for The King's Speech. It went nowhere. Only because of that. various things which I can't go into because, uh, you know, situations, one of the, the leading people, leaders of the film was the the woman it's a true story about the first woman to sail alone around the world oh, yes <clears throat> her husband was a world class sailor a wonderful wonderful man he was a driving force behind the whole thing and very very sadly had a freak accident after going around the world on the big round the world race and winning it two or three times he fell off the back of a boat and and, and got hypothermia and that sort of killed the project. Is that how you developed your interest in sailing, or were you a sailor before that? I was sailing, yes. Okay. I sailed in, in California, when I, I, and I, I loved it, and I thought it was a great story. It's still a great story, and I think it really should be made, but not with me. Not, 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 not with me involved in it, as I would yes. say. I, would never, I wouldn't, couldn't act in it now anyway. She was a young woman when this happened. So um, you so, decided... We're not going to shop it around. We're not going to do this with Andy. I just, I can't, I cannot, you know, be doing with this, running from this person and people wanting to change this and then they bring this person in and let's try that director. We did a little bit of that. And then I realized that especially with independent films, directors really want to do their own projects. If you, okay. if you get, um, if you're working and you have a, an office like the big directors and I, can't, someone like Spielberg or so on. Even Spielberg, he only does his own projects. 
he's not going to project somebody else. Somebody brings a film to him. He's not going to do it. I don't, I don't think, what do I know? But he wants to do his own stuff. And most directors want to do their own material. Right. That's my view anyway. And um, so um, I thought we, we've just got to do this. And um, this young director and writer, he, I've lost my train of thought a bit. He, he did a really good job with the script. And I said, Jason, we can carry on, you know, wandering around with this project if we want to, but I don't want to do that. Let's just do it. His mother has a wonderful house in um, Donegal in Ireland. It's a beautiful location. We can shoot nearly two-thirds of the film in it. Oh, great. He's got, he's got a very ambitious schedule. We're going to be shooting 70 s scenes in two weeks. Wow. Um, and then I got some investment, a little bit of investment, and he said we'll do a crowdfund on it. And he's put together a great crowdfunding pitch. And that's what we're doing now. We're, we're trying to raise some more money. So we'll shoot the large portion of the film in Ireland and then go back to England and shoot the rest of it. And a lot of it we, we don't need to do on location because you have, you know, you can just project with locations onto a, a screen like this now. And uh, it saves a lot of time and a lot of money. Yeah, that's so. great. Well, so this will be hap uh, scheduled to shoot? Well, we're shooting, starting shooting on March the 25th. He teaches at a film school and he says, I got a couple of weeks off, so we'll do it then. I thought this. <laughs> I uh, love the, the energy of these young people. I know. The energy, and I'm thinking, you know, and I'm I'm get, getting up there. I mean, I I did uh, I the the stage now. I I don't know that I would do anymore. I did uh, the the Scottish play, the you know, oh yeah Shakespeare, and I was exhausted at the end of it. And I thought the stamina, you know, because and even a film, even if you haven't got a lead role in it, you've always still got the adrenaline going. And it's the same on in the theatre. You've got a small part in play. You're sitting there pumping the adrenaline out off stage, waiting to go on. And at the end of it, you think, oh, so tired. <laughs> so this is going to take a huge burst of energy from me. But I just feel that I love acting. And um, I think this is such an interesting subject. And I think it's a story that needs to be told. Well, this, this, is, this theme is... Ancient, it goes back to Greek mythology, right? The um, automaton or a, a mechanical man. Yeah. Um, but in those, I mean, all the way up through, you know, the 20th century was always, oh, someday, you know, 50 years from now or 60 years from now. But now AI is like next week. This this thing that you're doing is not oh, really science fiction. It's absolutely. Well, this is really about AI in, in the care industry to a large extent. Well, it's pretty much that. Um, I felt that we're getting so isolated, and it's not just old people that are lonely. It's, there's a great deal of loneliness. So there's a, one of our last prime ministers uh, announced that she said loneliness is one of the new, it's, it's, it's a disease. Mm -hmm. And I've seen recent press things saying we now have to regard loneliness as, a, as an actual med medicinal, is that the right word? Sounds right. Yeah, uh, disease. It's not just old people who are very isolated by the modern world, the technology and everything else. And, and there's just the speed of everything. And the fact that people are isolated in urban, you know, communities, they, you know, in the old days you'd go out and you'd chat to the greengrocer, you'd chat to the butcher, you know, you'd have, and they had a purpose to interact with people. You go to the supermarket, nobody's going to talk to you. Well, and we've just been through all that with the COVID, right? The isolation. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's, it's right right now. Yeah. And it's created a great mental strain on people, I think. And I thought, well, <clears throat> what if, if they had a companion that was AI, you know? And this is the story of, of, of this woman who gets, her son says, I'm sending you a carer because there's a great shortage. That's the other thing huge shortage of real human carers in, yes. in the, I mean, I don't know, but I think in America, but certainly in England. Um, and I believe that they will start having sort of humanoid robots coming in. And in our story, he gets an, an upgrade to artificial empathy, mm -hmm. which if you look at that, if you look it up, it does exist. 
So now he's not only just copying, replicating, or um, the algorithms are not just, it's not just gestures or repeating, you know, the external. Sure. He's starting to build the internal. But how is it going to work? Because he can have empathy, but like you could have empathy with me, but you don't know my memories, my experiences. Right. I don't know yours. Um, and I think that that's where it's going to get really sort of interesting. And that's what the film, to a large extent, is about. Very good. So how would you characterize it? Is it a... Is it we call it a comic sci-fi. Comic sci-fi. Okay, good. There's so all comedy in there as well. Yeah. Oh, yes. We've got to have some comic moments. I think, again, uh, we live in such an uncertain and terrifying world at the moment. We've been so busy destroying ourselves with the environment and technology and possibility of nuclear war and wars already going on. I think people are scared. I think they need a little bit of a lift, so you've got to have some humor in there. We've got to keep our perspective on life Sounds like and, make, um, and make sure that we... Um, we keep it a little light. Sounds like your timing is perfect then. Yeah. So when you're finished, finished when this film is finished, what, what do you intend to do with it? Uh, we have uh, the, the company that um, th uh, distributed uh, New Chilling Tales have said, you know, provided they like it, that they will take it, oh, and, which wow. is great. So we do have a distributor who, you know, we, we have a, a, a um, what's the word? A distribution agreement, a commitment, but oh, you know, subject okay. to them liking the film. Yeah, we also have another distributor. I've, I did a film. I did a documentary in Ireland. Um, this is the Peter O'Toole. The Peter O'Toole documentary. Yeah. Have you seen it? I have not seen it yet. Oh, it's on. You must see it. It's on BritBox. Wonderful documentary, and I got um, very friendly with the Irish producer on that, who's doing another one now on on Alec Guinness, oh, wow. and. Um, He's a he's a great guy. He calls what well, he says. We're doing guerrilla filmmaking. This he calls this guerrilla filmmaking. Guerrilla, not gorilla. <laughs> well, that'll be yeah, the, the gorilla. So he he's yeah. tried to help us, and and he has introduced us to a, quite a big distribution sales company called One Hundred One International, and they have expressed some interest. But again, you've got to deliver it because there is no point in making any film unless you know you can distribute it. Well, this is great, but usually the, you don't always have a, a no. distribution agreement before no. you're no. We don't have, a, uh, I have to be honest, we don't have a full-blown distribution commitment yet. And I hope we don't get to a point where we have to start doing the, you know, the, the usual thing, which even the majors are doing, which is doing the festival round, you know, right. and they get picked up at festivals and so on. Uh, because there's quite a backlog of films apparently in L.A. now, which yeah. astonishes me. Well, there's not much, not much work going on there because of the strikes and, yeah, and all that stuff. Yeah, exactly. So if someone wants to um, participate by uh, contributing to this effort, how Well, we have happen? a crowdfund set up, yes, and there is a link to it, and anyone can go on it. And, and Jason has designated you as a, a given you the, the various, you know, five pounds. We're, we're doing a sterling, pound sterling budget. He says, you know, that five pounds will get you this, you know, 10 pounds will get you this, 20 pounds will get you, and it just goes on up. I think we stop at 50,000, actually. <laughs> you don't want, to, don't want to overdo it with anyone. <laughs> no. um, but I mean, one can it, film now with, with digital and, and all the technology does not have to be expensive. The costs right. come in with all of the other things, you know, actors, Although actors now, we all know, even in, in the, the A-listers, they will work for very little if the project is good. Yes. If they've got good material. They don't all want to be doing sort of, you know, wild action films. And if they want good scripts and, and a chance to, to do something with, with their talents, I think. And um, as I said, making film does not have to be expensive. The big cost, and this is something we will have to address again, is the marketing. Mm. Because, Lance, you know that you can make the biggest piece of in the world if it's marketed right. People will watch it. Yes. So you have to market the film properly. Yes. And we and we, we will need money for that. So we'll probably be doing a, a, a finishing fund as well, you know, for marketing. 
So, okay. yeah. And do, do you, to, to wrap up, looking back, do you, are you more satisfied with um, being a filmmaker and having the control over what? Yes. In that respect, having the control is the, is the best part of it, is that you, can't, you, you know you've got a good subject, a good project, and you can control what you set out to make. And, and do it the way you, you you do your vision. And most most filmmakers don't have that luxury if the budget is too big because they're dependent on other people for the money. Um, so, and it, it's it's fun, and I you know will carry on doing this as long as I can. And pro- I want to learn to be more on the other side of the camera. I think it'd be kind of fun. To, oh yeah, it'd be really interesting to well, do that. Well, you have the insight of. Uh, Performing on this side, yeah, and I, I know. I mean, I would if I'd love to direct, but I know how to tell actors what to do. It's the rest of it, I'm not sure about. That'll all come. Well, thank you, Jane. We um, I sure wish you luck with this well, project. Thank you, Lance. And we didn't talk a lot about you, but you're doing some writing at the moment. I'm doing um, ghost writing and uh, still script doctoring, and I just uh, finished writing a play. Oh, so wonderful. Uh, that. I hope I'll be able to read it. I will make sure you get get a copy shortly. I would love that. I would love that. And thank you very much for doing this with me. Thank you, Jay. Enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah.